This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Is it mother's instinct or just coincidence? Tonight, a fascinating look at the mysterious telepathic link between mothers and children. Carolyn Ebear was cleaning up after dinner when she suddenly sensed that her eight-month-old daughter was in grave danger. Carolyn rushed to the living room and saved the baby from choking. Elaine Emmy was overcome by a strong, inexplicable feeling of dread during an out-of-town trip. Later, she would learn that at that very moment, her son had been seriously injured in a fall. Both women attribute their experiences to a special sixth sense possessed only by mothers. Also tonight, in 1990, Anita Green was gunned down by an unidentified man in the parking lot of her husband's office. Two years later, a friend of Anita's, Michelle Salmon, was writing a book on the case and found herself targeted by a vicious unknown stalker who she believes is the same man who murdered her friend. This tragic accident left one person dead and three injured. But in reality, it was no accident. It was a result of a deadly con game gone wrong con games springing up all over the country, and you could be a target. And finally, the intriguing mystery of this century-old edition of the Bible. It was found accidentally in a second-hand store, its pages crumbling and its gold gilt long since faded. But as it turns out, there is a lot of life in this old book, The Enigmatic Secrets of a Family, whose heirs may be watching tonight. Join me. There seems little doubt that an almost magical bond exists between some mothers and their children. It is perhaps the most wonderful and heartwarming of all mysteries. January of 1974 was a blur of diapers and dishes for Carolyn E. Bear, a mother of two. But Carolyn will remember one day in particular for the rest of her life. It was in the evening. I was in the kitchen doing the dishes. My husband was down the hallway reading the newspaper. My daughter, Monica, was in there doing her homework. And Sarah, her little baby, was playing with her toys. And you know, you're not, your mind is not really usually very far away from your children. You think about them. And this night, I was thinking about Sarah. And suddenly, I had a feeling that there was something wrong. It was a very focused feeling. And in my mind, I saw that she was choking on something. I didn't know what. Sarah. Sarah? <coughs> what she had in her mouth. Carolyn says that she had inexplicably sensed her eight-month-old daughter silently choking on a balloon. Sarah, you've got to be careful. You would think about the what ifs. What if I hadn't listened? and just thought, well, I'll go in a few minutes. But this was not that sort of a feeling. This was, get there, you're needed. Call it mother's instinct. Call it ESP. Call it simply the power of love. Accounts of the extraordinary intuition of mothers have been handed down for generations. Such a bond seems to defy the limits of time and space. And while it may never be scientifically proven, it is far too compelling to be denied. It's not like watching your child walk down the street and say, oh, I know they're going to trip over the sidewalk. It's not like that. It's so powerful and so strong, and uh, it's very different feeling. 
Hi, how many? Two, please. Two. In 1983, business had taken Elaine Emmy and a neighbor, Sharon Crocker, to Palm Springs, 110 miles from their homes in Los Angeles. There you go. They were just sitting down to eat when Elaine was seized by an overwhelming sense of dread about her four-year-old son. I hungry. <laughs> it was like being hit by a wave. It was a very powerful feeling, both emotionally and physically. Sharon, mm -hmm. something's wrong. What do you mean, something's wrong? Something's happened to Matt. Oh, Elaine, stop worrying. I'm sure he's just... It's like someone flipping a switch. All of a sudden, you feel something. And two seconds before, you didn't feel that. You weren't thinking about that at all. Oh, Elaine, everything looks so good. I knew something was wrong with Matt immediately. And it wasn't just a foreboding. I mean, sometimes people get uh, a strange sense that something's not right. It wasn't like that. It was a very definite feeling, something that you couldn't just shrug off. Sharon Matthew has been hurt. I just know it. Elaine? I I'm going to go call home. I'll be right back. Elaine had instant panic. She wasn't what I would consider out of control, but just her mannerisms gave me the impression that she was very concerned and knew that there was something very wrong. Elaine immediately called home. No answer. Convinced that something truly terrible had happened, she phoned Sharon's husband, Tom. Hello? Hi, Tom, it's Elaine. Where are you? Tom had not heard from Elaine's husband or seen anything unusual at their house just across the street. No. So I said, well, then why don't we just have lunch? She said, no, there's something wrong. We need to go home. And that's what we did. Elaine, are you still worried? I don't know. I just can't get rid of this feeling that something awful's happened to Matt. Twice during the trip back to Los Angeles, Elaine stopped to call home. Do you want me to drive? No. Still, no one answered. I'm okay. Sharon tried to reassure me that everything was probably all right, but the sense of urgency was still there. And uh, there was nothing I could do to get rid of that feeling. It was the longest three hours of Elaine Emmy's life. When she and Sharon finally arrived home, Sharon's husband had stunning news. He had learned that Matt was in the hospital. Dr. Davis to emergency staff. Matt. Mom. Oh, thank God. Oh, Matt. When Elaine arrived, Matt was being prepped for surgery to reattach severed tendons in his arm. Just fine. He had fallen and crashed through a plate glass door at the very moment the sense of dread had swept over Elaine. I think Matt's going to do just fine, aren't you? I was feeling what Matt was going through, no doubt about it. I don't think I ever questioned that. Um, I'm not sure why I was able to feel that, but I know without any doubt what I was feeling and what I was experiencing. It made the hair stand up on the back of my neck thinking, oh my God, she actually did know that something was happening when it happened. Elaine and her son had been separated by more than 100 miles, and yet she had been as certain he was hurt as if she had seen the accident with her own eyes. Don't worry. Don't worry, it's gonna be just fine, okay? I think that this connection starts in the womb. I think e even in the womb, some children and some mothers are more connected than others. Uh, and if they are really connected, of course, then it will continue for the rest of their lives. It is a connection of love, whereby the mother anticipates the child's needs, whether it's a small baby, a toddler, an adolescent, but she anticipates it not only on a physical level, which of course is part of the maternal instinct, but on a level we might almost call telepathic, spiritual, so that the whole mother is in touch with the whole child. Sometimes it just happens once in a lifetime, and you may never be able to repeat it again. 
but it just happens. You have tuned in that one person who is sending out those signals because it's important to you. Mom and Dad, you can come along with us. If Elaine Emmy does have a psychic bond with her son, it seems logical that it originated in the womb. However, many adoptive mothers have also reported these astounding experiences. Simply the fact of having adopted a child doesn't mean the woman's divested of all her instincts. And I believe that women have instincts, a woman's intuition, whatever you want to call it. In March of 1987, Linda Babb and her husband Dirk, already the parents of four, were looking to adopt for the second time. Linda says that around that time, she had a most incredible dream, unlike any she's had before or since. Push, push real hard. Go ahead and push, push. push. I had a dream, That's it. Good, good. and in the dream I saw a young woman, and she was in labor. A light-headed woman that was fair-complected. And I didn't know who this person was, but I did see that she was in labor and at the point of giving birth. And as she pushed, I saw the baby's head crown and then be born. He had lots of dark hair on his head, I remember that, and he was dark-complected. And at the moment that he was born and began to cry, I woke up from the dream. I felt startled because it was a very vivid and realistic dream. I had never had a dream so vivid. And I looked at my clock on my bedside table, and it was 2.59 in the morning on March 8th. Next morning at breakfast, my wife said, Sweetie, I've got the most incredible dream. I witnessed the birth of a child. And I said, what child? She said, I don't know. Linda, Dirk, I'm so glad you could make it. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Six weeks later, we had a call from our adoption agency. We had applied to adopt, and they called and asked us if we would be interested in adopting a baby boy. Such a cutie boy. When they brought the baby in, he looked to me like the most beautiful baby I'd ever seen. He had beautiful golden brown skin and a head full of dark hair. He looked very much like the infant in my dream. How old did you say he was? Six weeks. Uh, let me check that. Yes, uh -huh. he was born March 8th. March 8th? What time? Uh, 2.59 a.m. When she told me the baby had been born March 8th at 2.59 in the morning, I was stunned. For a moment, I was just speechless, and I turned to Dirk and I said, that's the same time and the date of that dream I had. I thought my wife really had seen the birth of this child with her mother. That was the dream. And it was confirmation to me at that time that this was meant to be, that this was a child for us. Linda and Dirk adopted the infant, whose very birth Linda feels certain she witnessed. Any remaining doubts vanished 18 months later when Linda was shown a picture of her son's birth mother. My first thought was how beautiful she was and how much he looked like her. Then I realized that this was the light-haired, light-complected woman of the dream, the mother that had the baby. An adoptive mother can feel this communication almost as a radar of love, because whether she has formally applied to adopt a child or not, she still has in her heart this intention, and it's almost as if the right child somehow contacts her psychically, sometimes even before the child is born. Those two vibrations somehow meet each other, and it may happen once in a ten, once in ten thousand cases, and that's the one that we perhaps hear about. But that very special case just proves the fact that at least it can happen. I'm as skeptical as the next person, always looking for another explanation. It does seem a little far-fetched. 
All I can say it was a gift. I don't know why it happened or why I would be given such a gift. I, I just know that it happened, and that's the only explanation I have. Sarah. There Sarah. is no rational explanation for these things, but just because there's no rational explanation for these things doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It's gonna be just fine. I don't understand the connections, but I think the connections are there. And a lot of it probably just has to do with survival. We wanna make sure that the next generation grows up. Taken at face value, these three stories and countless others like them point to an apparent telepathic link between certain mothers and their children. While such a connection may never be fully explained, if you someday get the prickly feeling that your child is in danger, it might not hurt just to wander over and take a look. Next, a woman is gunned down in broad daylight, and the man who pulled the trigger is still on the loose. North Hollywood, California, October 25th, 1990. Oh a woman sitting in the driver's seat of her own car in the parking lot of her husband's accounting firm was shot once through the head. The woman's name was Anita Green. She never regained consciousness. After two days in a coma, she died, and the man who shot her is still at large. Now a woman named Michelle Samet believes the same man has targeted her. Michelle was Anita Green's friend. She has written a book called No Sanctuary about Anita's murder. The knowledge that this guy's out there, out on the streets, terrifies me every day, whether it's the person I think did it or not, because any person who did it knows that I know a lot about this case that they don't want me to know. This is a chilling story of two innocent women. One of them murdered, the other apparently stalked. It is a most bizarre and complex case, one of the highest profile cases in recent Los Angeles history. The saga began in 1974, when Anita Green met her husband. At the time, Anita worked as a bookkeeper in Mel Green's accounting firm. Both were married to other people. After nearly seven years, they left their spouses to wed one another. Anita's friends were shocked, not only because Mel weighed more than 500 pounds, but also because he convinced Anita to sign an outrageous prenuptial agreement. Basically, there was a provision in it that he wore the pants in the family, and he was the supreme boss, the god, the absolute ruler, and if they ever had an argument or disagreement, he would automatically win just because of that role. We'll review Kathy's report on Wednesday night. Anita threw herself into activities at her synagogue. Anita, well, hello? According to Anita's friends, Mel attended services less and less often as Anita's involvement grew. 8 p.m. Most of the time, Anita made excuses for her husband, but occasionally she let down her guard. Let's go. I'm late. All right. She'd say she was afraid of her husband, but then she said, oh, you know, Mel, he's just a loudmouth. He likes to hear himself talk. He's a blowhard. He's not really going to do anything to me. She had all the classic symptoms of an abused woman, thinking they were in control, thinking that they knew what they were doing, but really frightened and scared. Anita took refuge from her marriage by becoming more and more involved in the synagogue. Eventually, she was elected president of the congregation. As a result, Anita and the rabbi saw one another more and more often. Allegedly, the two became entangled in a love affair. When Anita asked Mel for a divorce, he was infuriated. Anita is bad. She's immoral. She doesn't deserve to live. I absolutely demand that my property is handed over to me. I have an extensive stamp and coin... Curiously, despite his bitterness, Mel was adamant that Anita continued to work with him at the accounting firm. She has to work for me. The business depends upon it. Mel was inconsistent. One minute, I don't need you, you're not worth anything. But the next minute, he would absolutely be insistent she had to work for him. And uh, frankly, I think... Uh, both Anita and Mel uh, were indirectly 
acknowledging that Anita knew where the bodies were buried. Throughout the divorce proceedings, Mel bombarded Anita and her lawyer with threatening letters. Only after Anita was murdered were the letters turned over to the police. Melvin Green did send some letters where he threatened to kill Anita Green. In my mind, it just gave more credence to him being involved in her shooting. So let me see if I understand. You were working at your Detective Hernandez soon found three different witnesses who believe they saw Anita Green's killer. One was a man who worked across the street from Mel Green's accounting firm. He had observed Green emerge from the building minutes before Anita arrived in her red Corvette. It's a door that uh, is not used very often. So it was unusual to this witness across the street to see this. After he observed Melvin Green looking, he observed Anita Green turned a corner, closely followed by a motorcycle. A second witness observed even more. He stated he was working on a roof directly across the street where Anita Green had parked her red Corvette. And what brought his attention was he heard a motorcycle arrive, parked on the wrong side of the street. He observed the individual approach Anita Green, fire one shot, immediately ran to his motorcycle, and at a high rate of speed, go northbound on the street. Finally, a third witness helped police artists come up with this composite. The witness had seen the motorcyclist just after Anita's murder without his helmet and visor on. Investigators began to suspect that Mel Green had hired a hitman to kill his wife. Mel Green's behavior at his wife's bedside did nothing to alleviate police suspicions. Only moments after Anita oh. died, with her body still in the room, Mel reportedly had a bizarre exchange with Anita's friend, Phyllis Bolton. I look pretty good, don't I? It's the new liquid diet that I'm on. He was talking no about food. how much no weight food. he had lost and how good he had looked. It was absolutely food. nauseating. There was not one moment of remorse, not one tear shed. He was as talkative as if she was wide awake and sitting there watching us. The day after Anita was shot, Detective Hernandez went to Melvin Green's office to interview him. You stop right there. I can't talk to you. My attorney says I can't speak with anyone. Why do you need an attorney? He's a criminal attorney. Why do you need an attorney? I'm only here to speak to you about your wife. You talk to my attorney. He says I can't speak to anyone. Now the scenario of Anita Green's murder began to gel. We were able to piece together the fact that Melvin Green specifically controlled the date and time Anita Green was supposed to be at his office. That would allow Melvin Green to have somebody hired to follow her and shoot her. And that's how Anita Green was shot. Ultimately, Melvin Green was arrested for conspiring to kill his wife even though there was no direct evidence that he had hired someone to shoot her. On March 4, 1992, a jury convicted Green of first-degree murder and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But the case was far from over. Mel Green appealed, claiming he was innocent, and the hitman, whoever he was, remained at large. In May of 1992, Michelle Samet visited Mel Green at the Los Angeles County Jail, where he was awaiting transfer to a state prison. Against his lawyer's advice, Green had agreed to be interviewed for Michelle's book. Hello, Mel. Hello, Michelle. How are you doing? You I wanted to go in there with an open mind, and I started to listen to him. And for the first few weeks of our visits, I wasn't certain of anything anymore. If I didn't shoot her, there's no connection. So there's more than one road to reasonable doubt. But as our visits continued, Mel himself made me more certain of his guilt than ever before. Michelle continued her investigation, but one thing nagged at her. How and when had Mel paid the hitman? 
Michelle claims that in the course of her research, she finally uncovered evidence that Mel Green had sold off a $30,000 coin collection just three weeks before Anita was murdered. Michelle told the police about her discovery, but decided not to tell Mel Green. My innocence will come. Michelle claims that during one of their subsequent interviews, Mel made unusual comments when another visitor showed up. You have another visitor. Oh, all right. This is a man I call my brother because he'd do anything for me. In fact, he's a homeowner because of me. You can wait outside. Mel had visitors come every day during our visits. My visits were all day long. Mel had never asked me to leave during his visits before, and, and that alone I thought was unusual. And I went downstairs, and I went into my car and sat. I knew I'd have about a half hour until this guy came out. And my mind started to run away with me that um, this guy looked a lot like the police composite of Anita Shooter. According to Michelle, when the visitor left, he got on a motorcycle, which fit the description of the one driven by Anita's killer. When I went back to the jail, I made a very stupid mistake. I said to Mel, I've got this theory. You paid for the murder with the money from the coins you said Anita stole. She didn't steal them. You're not going to write that. You can't write Michelle that. claims that when she told Mel her suspicions, he threatened her. Nobody's going to put those lies about me. If you end up dead after I make a call, you'll know who did it. I knew Mel likes to talk like that. You know, this is just a blowhard, just a man talking. And I realized, God, how stupid can you be, Michelle? That's exactly what Anita said, and she's dead. The next day, June 17, 1992, Melvin Green was transferred as scheduled to Calipatria State Penitentiary east of San Diego. He peppered Michelle Sammet with angry letters. He's threatened to harm my children. He's threatened to hurt me. Never before had I encountered this feeling of fear before because I'd never been so involved in a story before um, where it took on a life of its own. But I couldn't stop because I knew I had the potential to find the answer. Michelle Samet says that over the next few months, someone began to stalk her. The front gate to her house was ripped from its hinges. The house itself was vandalized. And finally, Michelle says that in the driveway of her own house, an unidentified man hit her in the face, breaking her nose. A lot of that has stopped now that the book has come out. But of course, you always live your life fearing that what you've uncovered might lead to some potential danger for your family. For me, I'm OK, because I understand that's the risk by taking this kind of story and by following through. For my children, I'm worried every day. Michelle Samet believes the man she saw visiting Melvin Green in prison was the same man pictured on the police composite. He would today be in his early 30s. He has blonde hair, dark eyes, and a muscular build and may own a red or maroon Suzuki motorcycle. Next, authorities need your help to stop a deadly insurance fraud scheme responsible for dozens of accidents on the nation's highways. It is an all too familiar scene on our nation's highways. Emergency workers struggle to free the occupants of a car which has been rear-ended by a tractor trailer rig. In this case, on Interstate 5 near downtown Los Angeles, the driver of the car and two passengers were rescued. However, a third passenger was pronounced dead at the scene. What made this tragedy all the more chilling was that it may not have been an accident at all. Authorities believe it was part of a carefully orchestrated insurance scam that backfired. The police in Los Angeles call it the swoop and squat, a scheme in which people intentionally create rear-end collisions in order to collect on bogus insurance claims. Authorities estimate that the swoop and squat costs consumers millions of dollars every year. 
Even though the scam originated in Southern California, it is now popping up all over the country. Watch closely. You may find yourself involved in one of these situations. Here's how the swoop and squat works. A typical operation involves two or three cars. They cruise the highway in tandem, searching for a victim. Incredibly, the vehicles they most often choose to target are the most dangerous, large tractor trailers. Trucks are a favorite target among uh, swoop and squat rings because, uh, one, they know that trucks will have a lot of insurance, and uh, uh, two, that there'll be a lot of damage, which is compensable by the insurance companies. The scam unfolds quickly. First, the squat car, normally filled with passengers, positions itself directly in front of the targeted truck. Then a second car pulls alongside the truck, effectively boxing it in. Over the next several miles, the driver of the squat car may try to distract the truck driver. Finally, the swoop car appears and makes its move, forcing the other drivers to jam on their brakes. Immediately afterwards, the people who are in the squad car will then claim injury. Injuries are almost always soft tissue injuries because they're so difficult to disprove. Uh, they'll exchange insurance information, and then uh, a couple of days later, the attorney makes the claim. We've had one situation where two attorneys made over $9 million from a two-year period of time from simply buying stage accidents. The ringleaders of the swoop and squat are often well-to-do attorneys who work out of the safety of their offices far removed from the accident scene. Each accident can mean up to $20,000 in false insurance claims, a large part of it pocketed by the attorney. By contrast, those who risk the most in the con game are paid the least. Usually a middleman called a capper seeks out people who are willing to do almost anything for money. The people who are in the swoop and squat uh, accidents as passengers or drivers may be paid as little as $250 to $300 uh, to risk their lives in that accident. Cappers uh, may get approximately $1,500. All the money is made by the professionals who are, are corrupt. Uh, the attorneys who are, are financing these stage accident activities. The crash on Interstate 5 had all the earmarks of a classic swoop and squat. But in this case, informants were willing to talk. They led police to the man who had allegedly organized the operation, one Philemon Santiago. Santiago was a Mexican national who lived in West Hollywood, California. A search of his apartment turned up documents linking him to a Beverly Hills attorney named Gary Miller. In a moment, the intriguing mystery of an old family Bible. Perhaps you can help locate the rightful owners. In a place like this, time stands still. Random moments of other people's lives are frozen, caught as if in amber. And behind every captured moment, every object is an untold story. When you collect antiques, you never know when one of those stories might intersect with your life and draw you into a small, unsolved mystery of your own. Jonathan Grady, a Los Angeles collector, understands that all too well. In 1980, Jonathan was out browsing when he spied a box of sundry items. Excuse me. Yes, how much for your Bunsen burners? Well, let me see. I'll tell you what. I'll give you the whole box for 75. How's that? Mm, yeah. That's too high. Yeah. I'll give you 50. Mm, okay, you can have the whole thing. I'll write it up. 
After buying the box, I noticed there was several other things in the box, things that I could use. And there were some oil cans there and old scrub brushes. And uh, there was this Bible. It was a very large Bible, very old. And the binding was, uh, was torn, and, but yet it was part of the purchase price, so I took it home. The Bible was more than a century old, so old it was literally falling apart. Its embossed cover was cracked, its pages crumbling. I thought something like this would be nice to display in my living room, but I had to have it repaired. And after checking with several bookstores in the area, I was told it would cost between two and $300. So I put it into the garage and I stored it away. The Bible lay forgotten in Jonathan Grady's garage, gathering dust and guarding its memories for more than a decade. In the meantime, Jonathan embarked on a writing career. One day he found himself in need of a quote from the book of Job. As he leafed through the old Bible, Jonathan was caught short by a presentation page, which he had not noticed before. Everything stopped right there. I was, I was completely surprised. I never found a character of Job. Instead, I found Lazarus. The Bible had apparently been given to a Mr. Charles Lazarus and his bride, Fanny Bergman, on their wedding day, March 25th, 1874. They were married in Cincinnati, Ohio. When Jonathan turned the page, the history of a family unfolded. Charles and Fanny Lazarus had recorded the birth of two sons, Joshua and Samuel, and three daughters, Bluma, May, and Raina. Joshua had married Dora Fleischman of America's Georgia, Samuel Ada Hassett of Posen, Michigan, and Bluma, a German immigrant named Michael Michelson. On the facing page, Charles and Fanny recorded the birth of one grandchild, Bluma's daughter, Helen May Michelson, born in Denver, Colorado, on May 2nd, 1895. I looked at this Bible for several days after that. I would refer to this page back and forth. I watched his kids grow. Some unknown source pulled me into this man's life, and I have not quit. I have not quit trying to locate another man's family. This is Jonathan Grady in Los Angeles. I'm calling you regarding the Lazarus Family Bible. Jonathan became obsessed with returning the treasured family heirloom to its rightful owners. Thanks to his efforts, several newspaper articles were published, and he actually got a lead. This letter from 81-year-old Bernard Fleischman of South Carolina. Mr. Fleischman had Nat Dora, long since dead, from the town of Americus, Georgia. He felt she might be the same Dora Fleischman who married Joshua Lazarus. Unfortunately, Mr. Fleischman had lost touch with his Aunt Dora's family, but the letter only strengthened Jonathan Grady's resolve to find an heir to the Lazarus family Bible. There are family members. There were four siblings, living siblings of this man, all married. There has to be a granddaughter, a great-granddaughter, a great-great-granddaughter. There's a relative there, I know. The original owner of the Bible, Charles Lazarus, died on the 4th of July, 1913, and was buried at Mount Carmel Cemetery in New York. Any direct descendant of Charles and his wife, Fanny, would have a legitimate claim to the family Bible. Next, a respected physician is now on the run, charged with sexual assault. We will call the young woman you are about to meet Patricia. She is the daughter of a military chaplain. On January 7, 1992, when she was 19, Patricia went to a clinic in San Diego, California, complaining of flu symptoms. Okay, thank you. Patricia had no way of knowing that the doctor who had examined her that day had recently been forced to resign from the staff of another clinic. Four different complaints of sexual misconduct had been filed against him each by a young woman in her 20s. The doctor's name was Arvind Sinha. 
the California State Medical Board had chosen not to revoke his license, stating that all four complaints were cases of the patient's word against the doctors. Well, you definitely are congested. I know, that's what I thought. Uh, yeah, where's Dr. Sinha right now? Dr. Sinha. He kept me asking me questions about family, about um, having a boyfriend, and I was really sick. I had a fever, I wasn't feeling well. This combined with um, all the questioning, it really just threw me off, you know? I just figured that he was just trying to be more helpful and caring. Yeah, yeah. You have a boyfriend? Patricia says that with a nurse gone, Dr. Sinha's examination became a criminal assault. He manipulated me into a position where I couldn't even see what he was doing. And I didn't even know what he was doing or trying to do until I had finally realized that he had raped me. <laughs> well, after he had left the room, I just started crying. I knew what had happened, but I just could not believe that that had happened to me. I'm OK. Yeah, I, I, Patricia was afraid to let anyone at the clinic know what had happened. She telephoned her mother. A short time later, Patricia's parents took her to another hospital. She was examined and the authorities duly notified. After a week-long investigation, Dr. Arvin Sinha was arrested by Detective Christine Gregg of the San Diego Police Department. He had no reaction. He kept repeating after I told him what she was alleging. He said, oh, how interesting. And throughout the interview, he repeated, how interesting. No emotion, no reaction, just, uh, he said he didn't do it, that he might have been framed, but uh, I would have expected a little reaction out of an innocent person. The next day, Dr. Sinha posted his own $175,000 bail. Within a month, he had disappeared. Later, his medical license was revoked by the state of California. Every woman he's around is in danger. He's not going to stop. Uh, he had four warnings and lost a job, and then he came back and raped Patricia. He's not going to stop. The only two places I really felt safe was at church or at the doctor's office, you know. And now, you know, I don't have that trust for anybody anywhere. Join me next time for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries.